Well, I'm very happy to be here. My name is Russell Targ, and I'm a physicist. And it's my great pleasure to tell you about the remarkable work we did at Stanford Research Institute investigating psychic abilities. We did that for the CIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, NASA, and many, many other intelligence agencies, part of the U.S. government intelligence system. I got into all this as a childhood magician, standing on the stage in New York doing mental magic. And I had the experience from time to time of having a direct perception of something in the life stream of the person whose mind I was pretending to read or whose fortune I was prepare, pretending to tell. So I was not a real psychic. I was just a kid doing magic. But I've now talked to people like Kreskin and Melbourne Christopher, and they said, oh, yes, every professional magician knows that from time to time you're given some material, and you can then supplement your magic trick with whatever ESP comes to you. And there are many magicians who do that, as we know. But I was not doing magic for the CIA. We, as we know, the CIA is not easily amused and we were trying to do the real thing for them. The work we did at SRI involved things like finding a downed Russian airplane in North Africa with code books on it, locating a kidnapped American general in northern Italy, looking into a Soviet weapons factory in uh, Soviet Siberia, describing the construction of a huge Soviet submarine in northern Russia, and we even looked in on, a, so, on a Chinese atomic bomb test three days before it was scheduled to go off and described correctly that it was going to fail. So we did quite a lot of useful things for the government during our 23-year program. The ability we're talking about is a natural psychic ability that we all have in spite of what you may have heard to the contrary. People can quiet their mind and describe and experience what's happening in a distant place or in the future. And this has been talked about for thousands of years. Buddhists, Buddhists have a vast lore about what this is and how to do it and why it's desirable. And I'll try and talk about that later. The ability allows you to quiet your mind and describe and experience what's happening in the future. And you can do that independent of the distance. The most interesting thing that we found as physicists is that it's no harder to describe what's happening in Soviet Siberia, 6,000 miles away, than it is for you to describe the funny object I have in my pocket. 6,000 miles away does not decrease the accuracy or the reliability as compared with something nearby. Looking into the distance is no harder than looking at a contemporaneous event, and that's why this is called a non-local perception. Not quantum mechanical particularly, it pertains to the fact that we live in a non-local space-time described as a, scientifically, most recently by Schrodinger in the 1920s and then proved in the 1970s and 1980s. So the idea of non-local connections is not new age. This is accepted in the physical community. The hottest topic in modern physics is exploring non-locality. It was described originally by the Buddhists 2,000 years ago, but modern physics has finally caught up. The leaders of the program that we had at SRI are all physicists. The physicists are taking over what used to be called parapsychology. Uh, the three leaders of the program were myself and, Ed, and Hal Putoff, who are both laser physicists, and Ed May, who is a nuclear physicist. And we were eager that our scientific friends would not think that we'd gone off the rails into ESP research. So we made sure that we published everything we did, all of our experiments in the world's most prestigious journals where we would normally publish our science. So we published our work in the Proceedings of the Institute of Electrical Engineers, the uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Institute of Physics, and Nature magazine. So this is not, um, I just want to emphasize that at the time we were doing this work, this was mainstream, written up in the New York Times, published in the premier journals uh, in the world. And I want to give you an idea of 
where I was when this all began. In the 1960s, I was a hardcore laser guy. And here I'm standing in front of a thousand watt carbon dioxide laser at my most mavericky self. I'm trying to convince the government that I indeed had a thousand watts coming out of this one meter package. And you see how we've got a little meter bar there. Government thought it's impossible because their lasers were a hundred times bigger than mine. So I had a thousand watts over something a meter long. They thought that is impossible. So it's like a reprise of what I was going to do 10 years later, trying to convince the government that some other impossible thing actually happened. So in this case, the idea is that I have a big fire brick, I'm going to drill a hole right through it, and then hand the skeptical government scientist this big grip brick with a red hot hole right drilled through it, and I'll ask him, do you want fries with that? Or... <laughs> and eventually they supported our program. They couldn't deny the fire brick with a hole. Today we would consider that kind of thing a paranormal object. There's no way to create a red hot hole with a fire brick because uh, it's not flammable. So that, that's what I had done. That was my career. I've been in laser. I was a laser pioneer. I was working with lasers many years before there were any lasers. So this was the outgrowth of my earliest studies in graduate school. So the question that uh, led to the, my recent book, I wrote a book with a provocative subtitle, A Physicist's Proof of Psychic Abilities. And the idea is that proof is evidence so strong that you can't statistically or reasonably deny it. That's what we mean by proof. You can't prove scientific things in the laboratory the way you prove mathematical theorems. You prove things in the laboratory by piling up so much evidence that it's simply unreasonable to deny it. So here we are in our laboratory, 1973. There's Pat Price in the middle. Pat Price was one of our great, great psychics. He was police commissioner of Burbank and retired. He's playing here with an ESP teaching machine that was the basis of our first NASA program. My idea was, can you offer feedback and reinforcement and help people improve their psychic ability with a little random game where you have to guess which picture will be illuminated? The answer is yes, you can learn. And the great good news for you today is that game is now available as a free application for your iPhone. So, so I posted that as a little gift. It's called ESP Trainer, and you can just download it and have it on your iPhone. It'll ring a bell when you get the right answer and show you a pretty picture. So that's Pat Price. Price was an extraordinary psychic. He lived in a psychic bubble. He was an inspiration for me as to what ESP looks like in an evolved person. We were once called by the Berkeley Police Department where Patricia Hurst was kidnapped. And they said, we're so desperate, can you help us with your ESP program? It shows how desperate they were. And Pat Price and Hal Putoff and I drove to Berkeley and Price said, let's see your mug book. He's a no-nonsense guy, had been in lots of police stations. I want to see the picture book with all the usual suspects. He turned the page, page after page, and said, that's the guy, that's the ringleader. And he put his finger on Donald DeVries, who was indeed the ringleader. It's extraordinary. But they learned that only two weeks later. The police said, well, can you tell us something right now that'll help us? And Price said, would you like to know where the kidnap car is? And they said, you're kidding. He said, well, so if you drive about 50 miles north on Bayshore Free on Highway 101, the kidnapped car is a white station wagon. It's on the right, parked by a diner across from two large white gas storage cylinders in the pedestrian overpass across the freeway. And one of the detectives said, well, I know where that is. That's on my way to my home in Vallejo. 20 minutes later, they had found the car, and there were still cartridges rolling around on the floor of the car. That's as close to magic as I've ever seen in my 20 years in the laboratory. And <laughs> the other folks there are Bob Monroe, who wrote about journeys out of the body, how to go from remote viewing to an out-of-body experience, but that's outside our schedule for today. And I'm on the right 40 years ago, and what that shows is that if you live long enough, you get to do a lot of interesting things. <laughs> So this is the 
first in a series of experiments we did over a course of a decade, and it's basically what convinced the CIA to give us money. That is, is that what we played is a kind of psychic hide-and-go-seek, and all the pictures I'm going to show you are like this, so I won't uh, reiterate. The way it works is Pat Price, or the psychic of the day, is in a shielded room, electrically shielded room with me, and Hal randomly is, a, is sent to an undisclosed location, random target picked by the lab director. He generally will go with the colonel from the army or our lab director or our contract monitor. In this case, they went to a swimming pool complex called Rinconada Park. Price with me said, I see a water purification plant. I see a square pool, 65 by 80, and a round pool, 100 feet in diameter, and two water storage tanks. That's what I see, and that's what he drew on the right. Actually, they had gone to the swimming pool complex, and when we got there for feedback after the experiment, we saw the swimming pool is really 110 feet in diameter, and the rectangular pool is 75 by 100. So viewed from five miles away, he had the dimensions architecturally correct to 90%. Now, he had added in these two water tanks, which are on the right side of the picture, which are not at the location. And it's not a water purification plant, it's a swimming pool. However, and that's a story I would tell up to about 10 years ago, when the city of Palo Alto sent us a picture book showing what the city used to be like 75 and 100 years ago. 75 years, the psychic ones know all the, uh, what the answer is going to be already. 75 years ago, this was a water purification plant, and the tallest thing in the city of Palo Alto were the two water tanks I show at the top, then Price drew at the left. So what he apparently did is move his awareness five miles south on Middlefield Road and describe the park where the guys were hiding, and then moved his awareness 75 years back to describe the biggest thing in the city. Off my schedule, I got to tell you, he also described a National Security Agency code facility in Virginia. And he described that and was able to read the file folders. And people wanted to know, why did you pick this to read? And he said, well, the more, in psychic space, the more you hide something, the sh brighter it shines. So let that be warning to anybody who's having an affair. <laughs> so the demonstration of ability test that we had from the CIA, uh, John McMahon, who's head of the CIA, said to us, you guys are wasting your time looking at swimming pools and churches. We have targets that would be of national security now, help. Can you describe a target and I'll send you the coordinates? So Price and I climbed back into our little shielded phone booth, and he said, well, I'm psychically laying on a building, and a giant crane is rolling back and forth over my body. There's a huge crane. It has eight wheels, four on either side of the building. And in this building, they're constructing a 60-foot steel sphere, and they're welding it together. That all turned out to be entirely true. In fact, it was so true that after the steel sphere was verified, we then had a congressional investigation called by the House Intelligence Oversight Committee to see if there had been a security leak. This in the spirit of no good deed goes unpunished. But, uh, but the Congress eventually said what we're doing is okay. We were supported by CIA and Defense Intelligence Agency and told to press on, and we pressed on for another 15 years. Another experiment that I'll show you because it's of particular interest to me is that Hal Putoff then went to travel. I was the interviewer through all of these. I, my vision is very poor, as you probably caught on, so I don't drive. And Hal was always the outbound person, and I was a stay-at-home psychic travel agent working with the person, <laughs> working with the person trying to elicit a description of the distant place. So this time, Hal was on a business and pleasure trip to Columbia, South America, and each day, Price sitting with me would describe, I see a church, I see a volcano, there's a harbor, there's a market, and on day five, he didn't show up. So in the spirit that the show must go on, 
I said, well, I'll describe it. I've never done a remote viewing be before, but I'd interviewed countless, countless psychics and other visitors, so I knew the, I knew the moves. So I said, well, this is Russ Targ, remote viewing with Pat Price. Price isn't here. When I close my eyes, I see something that looks like an airport on an island. There's ocean at the end of the runway. There's sand and grass on the right. There's an airport building on the left. That's what I get. And that's where he was. He was on an island airport off the coast of Colombia called San Andreas. My great coincidence of the day, as I was driving here, I was talking to the cab driver. He was from, from San Andreas and gave me a f color photograph of the airport on the island. <laughs> How's that for, this is my lucky day. I don't, I don't claim that's ESP. That, that's what you call a lucky day. Uh, I finally escaped from the laboratory and got to travel across the country and two other people were psychically tracking me. The first place I went was New Orleans and no one knew, of course, where I was and I chose my target by throwing a die on the pavement and the die came out, sent me to the New Orleans Superdome. So I was sitting and standing in front of the Superdome recording my coordinates. This is noon, this is Russell Targ, I'm standing in front of the Superdome it looks like a flying saucer shining in the sun. Bad thing to say. Back in the laboratory, my friend, another physicist, Gary Langford, very psychic, straight up physicist, was working with Elizabeth Rauscher, who interviewed him. She's another physicist. All these people are professional physicists interested in the psychic stuff. Gary said, well, I have a clear picture of a circular building. It looks like a giant UFO. Do you think Russell's been abducted? <laughs> so Elizabeth said, just tell me what you see, make a drawing. And of course, his drawing was a remarkably accurate. This was his also first remote viewing. G Gary just got, came in and said, well, I c I've been doing this all my life, avocationally. That's how I was an analyst looking at photo analyst looking at specks of buildings and describing what's inside. So he was experienced to look at fuzzy images, uh, but here we just took away the image, but it didn't interfere with his ability at all. Our great pleasure was then to have this Army Intelligence ask us to train, to, to set up a psychic Army Corps something like the, in the men who stare at goats, but not quite. We didn't know goats were killed in our program. Uh, but we chose six army officers to work with us from a big, big group that we interviewed, Hal and I interviewed. One of those was Joe McMonagall, who Joe is still alive and is probably the greatest living psychic today, re prodigious psychic. And his first trial, sitting with me, what's this remote viewing stuff? Uh, all of these people are, are basically tough army officers showed up in their boots and leather jackets and their patches and their backpacks. What, what's this psychic stuff? What do you want me to do? Betting their careers that this is a new interesting uh, juncture for them. So I described remote viewing as I always do. I've been doing workshops now for 20 years. My, my ritual, the shibboleth is close your eyes quiet your mind and describe the surprising pictures that, look in your, that appear in your awareness. Don't try and name it, don't try and guess, just describe the surprising images. And that language was understood 1,200 years ago and appears in Patanjali's guide, Self-Liberation for Seeing with Naked Awareness. If you want to move from suffering and conditioned awareness to freedom and naked awareness, sit down and shut up and quiet your mind, stop naming, stop guessing, and you're on your way. So that's what I'm still, t still telling uh, people following the 1,200-year-old guidebook. As an author, it's very nice for me to see a book still in print 1,200 years later. It gives, gives me courage that my books will be around. <laughs> so Joe drew this picture. He said, I, they're at he and his colonel, his colonel went with Hal Putoff. And Joe said, I see a building with stripes in front and a long portion behind a little fountain. He drew what was there, and of course the judges had no problem matching that. With our six army officers, that I'll describe later, there's six people who had never done this before. 
I had them each do six trials a week, and we had each one, so we had 30 for six weeks, so we had 36 trials. You'd expect them to get six first place matches by chance. We got 19 first place matches, and they set up the Psychic Army Corps and ran another 15 years. They had 30 people on the East Coast working in tandem with the SRI group. So this is Hella Hammond, the funny story with her. Hella was my dear friend for two decades before the SRI program. And they said, well, uh, Pat Price is a fantastic psychic. Ingo Swan is the one who taught us how to do remote viewing. We want to see what a control person is. CIA said, what, what does an ordinary person do? Well, Hella's not exactly ordinary. She's a woman of the world, speaks many languages, professional photographer, but she thought it would be very amusing uh, to be hired as a psychic of the various things that she had done in her life. So she came to work with us. The bottom line is she became the most proficient and most reliable person in the program for the decade, our control subject. Her first trial with me, as you catch on now, we're sitting in a shielded room. Hella says, when I close my eyes, what comes into my view is squares within squares within squares. That's what Hal put off sees, and he was at a pedestrian overpass. Hella's nine trials were even more significant than Pat Price's nine trials. In Price's, the judge guessed seven of them first place match. What that means is that if Hal Putoff had been separated, had been kidnapped nine, day, nine times in a row, Price would have found him seven out of the nine times the first place he looked. Very remarkable. So here's Hella Hammond and Ingo Swan. Ingo taught us all how to do remote viewing. The way it worked is that Ingo taught Hal and me how to do remote viewing. Hal and I taught the six army officers. The army officers taught the world. So if you look at Google right now, we're still up on Google, and search for remote viewing, you'll find more than two million pages dealing with remote viewing, operational things to do with remote viewing. Two million pages is quite a lot of pages for something that many people don't think exists. <laughs> so at the end of the decade, reason for showing this is people get better in remote viewing. There's no decline effect. So at the end of the decade, we're still doing experiments with Hella, who is a kind of technophobe. She can change the batteries in her light meter, but she's a non-technical person. She finds physicists very amusing in their unworldly ways. But, but in this experiment, uh, we gave her the coordinates for this in, Latin, in binary form. Someone was concerned that maybe she'd memorize the globe. So we gave her the coordinates 1001110 west, one, one, something, north. She said, well, that's a pretty pattern. Uh, what comes to mind is a belly button-shaped energy expander. This is, a, this is your, your photographer, your artist, belly button. The target is the Berkeley Bevatron, which is indeed an energy expander. And she drew this middle drawing with the four beam tubes coming out of it, going to a target building, and the belly button shape is the Bevatron. And the picture from the laboratory is shown on the left. Now, I'd been looking at this picture for a decade, and it occurred to me as I'm writing my current book that my opinion, see, everything I told you up to now is true. My opinion on this picture is that she wasn't actually looking at the site, which is a big mass of concrete and steel, but she was looking 10 minutes ahead at her feedback picture because her drawing is anomalously accurate to the picture that we showed her at a later time. So she was really cheating here. She wasn't, look, she wasn't looking at the Berkeley Bevatron. Instead, she just looked ahead a few minutes to see what we we're going to show her for feedback. <laughs> and during in that process, she said, this is such a complicated thing. I can't grasp it. I want to make it out of clay. So this is her clay model of the Bevatron with the hole in it with a circular particle beam four beam tubes in target building, 50 miles to the north. She absolutely had never seen a Bevatron before. And of course, the people interviewing her had no idea what the target was. So how do we evaluate these things? The effect size 
is a measure of the power of the experiment you're doing, not necessarily the statistical significance. You can inflate your statistics by doing millions and millions of trials. The effect size takes out the fact that you've done millions of trials and says, how powerful is this experiment? So the idea of proof is that when the government was doing tests, the NIH was doing tests to see if aspirin helped men avoid heart attacks, they did this experiment and eventually the thing had such a large effect size, they stopped the experiment because they didn't want to deprive the poor controls of the benefit of the aspirin. Got it? The effect size was so high they stopped the experiment. The effect size got all the way up to 0.06. And here's the NIH report with the effect size is 0.06 standard deviations. All of our experiments exceed that by a factor of 10. So if the NIH thinks that the, this is my little argument for proof. If the, if the NIH thinks that they have proven that all of you should be taking aspirin and the experiment is so strong, you've got to stop it and give aspirin to the poor controls, that's what they mean by proof. Stop the experiment as proven. Our effect size is 10 times what they had. So in our experiments we did with Pat Price, we're significant at odds of almost one in a million, more than that one in a hundred thousand. His, his effect size was more than 10 times the NIH. So this by itself is an experiment more than one in a hundred thousand. In Hella Hammond's experiments, it was even more significant than Pat Price's experiments even though she was a control subject. The Army people, which is sort of my pride and joy in that we just brought in six guys, taught them to do remote viewing, and they did astonishingly well. Effect size, again, 10 times the uh, aspirin experiment. And it was working with the Army people that led me on a career of doing workshopping for the past decade, traveling around, just teaching people to do remote viewing. On Google, you will find many, many people teaching you to do remote viewing. They all can teach you to do remote viewing. Remote viewing is easy to do. I have a chapter in my book where it describes if you work with a friend, you can quickly both become psychic. Remote viewing is a natural ability. You don't have to eat porridge at the feet of your guru or pay anybody thousands of dollars. <laughs> This is a natural ability, like vision or hearing. Psychic abilities are not sacred. They're abilities. They allow you to experience all kinds of remarkable things. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But here are all these guys, highly psychic. At the end of our program, right after I left, I formed a little organization called Delphi Associates. We were using remote viewing to forecast silver futures, working with an experienced remote viewer, we did nine forecasts, whether silver is going to go up a little, up a lot, down a little, down a lot. All nine forecasts were correct. We made $120,000, which is a lot of money in the 1980s. And we're on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, BBC Horizon, Nova made a film about us. In the 1980s, ESP still existed. <laughs> and there are now many, many organization, the groups of people using this associative remote viewing, which is invented by my friend Stephen Schwartz. It's a way of, even though you can't read psychically, it's a way of making substitute items for what you want to know. I can't explain that. You have to read my book, has a chapter on associative remote viewing, which is an easy guide to investing in the market. You do not have to give away your mind to be psychic. That's not required. You can be discerning and be psychic. I recommend that. <laughs> so you have to decide now. I've given you a sample of what we did during the first decade of SRI. We did experiments for the government. We did operational things, finding all sorts of... We look, even looked in on the American hostages in Iran success and described that one was going to be evacuated because of illness. So you have to decide is the statistical evidence from our experiments at SRI strong enough to make you think that something like ESP really exists, exists? Or do you think it was just our lucky day and we were successful in fooling the American intelligence establishment for 23 years? 
and live to tell the tale. So you, you get to decide which of those is more likely. Now, you can use remote viewing these days to find your car keys. We just had an example of using remote viewing and not finding the car keys, and that happens also. Or you can find a parking place, even in Los Angeles, and we were exemplary successful doing that yesterday. So you can find your car keys, find a parking place, you can make money in the stock market, and my opinion is that the most important thing you can do with remote viewing is discover who you are. Now, it's important for me to tell you that remote viewing is not a spiritual path, but if you learn to quiet your mind and move your awareness into timeless awareness, you are likely to begin to experience things that surprise you, give you another view of reality. For example, if you look in the mirror in the morning and think that who you see in that mirror is who you really are, you're in for a lot of suffering, in my experience. My opinion is that who you really are is non-local awareness independent of space and time. You are that awareness that allows you to move your ex experience, to move your consciousness, to move your perception anywhere in the world independent of space and time. And this was described in great detail, as I mentioned, by the great Buddhist teacher Padmasambhava in the 8th century, where he said, you have to give up your desire to name things and grasp onto them and guess what they are, because in the universe it's really empty of names, as you may have noticed. But you can give up your desire to defend your ego and what it says on your business card in conditioned awareness and if you think that you may not be made entirely of meat and potatoes, then you can move your awareness into naked awareness, experience the universe as it is, and find a uh, transcendent way to experience uh, the world. And my invitation for you is to explore this transcendent place, and then as a scientist, next year you can come back and tell us what you experienced. And thank you.